obviously is a very active performer throughout the state uh, in, in a variety of contexts, whether it's solo, chamber music, or orchestral performance. Uh, so with that, uh, I'd like to just turn it over to Larry. Um, he's going to talk about embouchures today. And please, let's welcome Larry. Well, that was way too much. Too much information about it. Uh, one thing you should know that since that was written, boy, that is aging. I got, I remember you got that, I got to date that thing. One thing I have been doing for the last uh, nine years or so is composing. And I guess that was written before that happened because I have written two horn sonatas, a woodwind quintet, a sextet for piano and winds. Um, I'm it's a writing a violin sonata, uh, a variety of other things. So that's been a real important part of what I do now too. But so uh, I just want to make sure that you knew that I was doing something, something new with my, with my life. And after a while you think, oh, I've played in that and I've played this and I've played that. You always want to find a new challenge. What they asked me to talk about today was long for sure. But I want to talk a little bit about you guys for a minute. I mean, where, here you are with these incredible machines in your hands. They're kind of messy. I mean, they're just like spaghetti. they will just wrapped up together. And, uh, very far from where this actually came from. And it's amazing that we do this. It's important that we do this. This is one of the last things you can do and not have to be hooked up to some kind of you know, electronic power source to get to work. And it's important that we preserve these things that you have to be, that just sits there and does nothing unless you make it work. It's really, really important. And it's so ancient. You know, the very first horns were actually uh, hacked right off the heads of animals. They were uh, just ram's horns, actually. And do you know what they were called? Does anybody know the word those early, those early words that they were called? The Hebrew. Shofar. that's right. Shofar. And uh, it kind of grosses me out to think that somebody actually eventually, somebody had to be the first one to put his lips <laughs> on a ram horn and go, I wonder what that would do. That's kind of disgusting. It's kind of like the first person who made a mushroom. Yeah, but, you know, it's like the first person that said, hmm, let's see, let, me let, me a, let me string some intestines <laughs> over this box and scrape some horse hair across. It's the first guy that did that. You know, it's amazing that this actually occurs. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. And, and yet, uh, without, you know, the, I'm going really to talk a lot about the history, but pretty soon, this, these were used for an enormously important signaling in, in, in the, the Baroque era. They were even used by royalty to signal uh, occurrences in the battle. As a matter of fact, uh, for a long time in early Europe, it was illegal to own a horn if you weren't part of the signaling staff of the local nobility. If, if you could actually, it was actually a capital offense to play a horn and not be part of the, the well, or, or trumpet. I mean, back at the time, there was really no difference, just this brass instrument. Thing. Because it was the equivalent of somebody hacking into NORAD and you know, messing with the codes of today's nuclear uh, arsenal. It was, you know, that's pretty serious, too. So these things have a, 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 because of that, they've always been associated with nobility. And uh, in early operas, whenever the king comes in, you've got trumpets and horns heralding that fact. So we've got this noble tradition of how to make it work, the whole embouchure thing. It's pretty incredible when I make my living just going, I mean, that's pretty amazing. I can do that. Because of that, I get paid all these, you know, so much. <laughs> I'm actually not supposed to tell, but I tell you, it's, it's it, you know, it works. I, I can buy a house and all the toys, so. Yeah, and, and really, I do it because I can go. Now, I do a lot of concerts for kitties. Little kitties, you know, and they're real cute, and we, we play them cute little songs, and we always show them how the buzz works, and we, we always say, so really, we just go like this. And always, the kids can all do it. Every one of them, and they just and they you don't you don't even, you don't even have to ask them to. They just come back with it. They can all do it. It's amazing. I've never seen a kid that couldn't. On the other hand, when I try to start adults on the horn, it's like you want me to do what? <laughs> they can't do it. It's often 
And I think part of that is because with, with, as adults, we figured this has got to be some big sophisticated thing. It's, if it's artistic, so it can't just be the noise you make when you're imitating some kind of machine or like a, an engine, you know. So it's funny that little kids can do this pretty naturally, but we find it difficult as adults when we try to start. Now, our embouchure is actually a, 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 a horrible compromise because of, of history. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about the history <laughs> of, uh, of horn playing and the way embouchures uh, developed. In the old days, you didn't have to be able to play the whole range of the instrument and be a really fine player. You could be what they call a corno secundo, <coughs> who would play just basically the logo. And it could go a little bit high, but that wasn't what they specialized in. Or you could be a corno primero, and you'd be one of the guys that plays all the high notes. Um, and you had different embouchures to uh, facilitate that. It's, it's really interesting that most of the great soloists in the classical era, the Baroque and classical era, many of them at least, were corno secundos, which today we call it a second horn player, a low horn player. And um, they had a special kind of embouchure in which they would actually place the rim of the mouthpiece inside the bottom of the leaf. Not all the way, not on the teeth, but they place it right there. So there was practically no bottom lip in there at all. Is there anybody that plays that way here, by the way? All the time? Uh, <laughs> all the time. I've, I've got a couple of students that are trying to play that way, and I'm trying to break them. Yeah, you know, the weird thing is is that several of the professionals in the Utah Symphony through the years have played exactly like that. Steve Prozer does now. Steve is, an, oh, by the way, the German term for doing that is called Einsetzen, it means setting in. And Einsetzen is setting in on the sure Steve Prozer, the symphony does it, Shelly Showers used to do it, and Bill Barnowitz played that way as well. These are famous names in the horn world, and they've all been through Utah, playing very beautifully professionally. And I have no idea how to do it. I can't teach that on the sure, except, as you mentioned, uh, you're not Jim, you're... Yeah. Rex. Rex, that's right. You told me that, Mike. Okay. You said something not all the time, right? Why would you use that on the show then? You, you use it well. to play low. See, it still works. It works really well. Now, when you guys go for your low notes, how many of you go ahead and put that mouthpiece kind of on the bottom lip inside and then put lots of top lip in? Is that a new thing for everyone, or is that something you're kind of used to? It's new. It's new. Why don't you try it? You've got your words out, right? Let's just give it a shot. Right. If you just put a knife in it, lay it inside, and then pack it up. Could you show us? I, I, it looked like you were doing it. Let's see if you got that to work. Just, uh, just right down there, right, right inside. Yeah, see, it works really well. Now, for modern players, most of the time we're going to use that on the show, unless you're a 9 sets and guy, which I can't do. I don't know how they play high on that at all. But for most of us, we would only use that on the show if we were going to play an isolated note. And there are some really famous isolated notes. There are some notes in uh, Mahler's Third Symphony, for example, that are really low. They go all the way down to here. That's that E. And uh, if you can't, you know, you got to be able to get that quick. And most of the rest of us, if we're going to try it on a modern on the show, which is I'm going to tell you about in a minute, we kind of go. So we switched to Einstein, which uh, she learned like in 12 seconds. Pretty amazing learning curve there, don't you think? And you get those notes and uh, play them really well. So that's um, uh, part of where our heritage comes from, is this whole idea of using lots of top lip, almost no bottom lip at all, 
and then making sure that we can uh, play very, very well. Now the other embouchure that comes out of the old days is called setting on, or in German they would say on setzen, which is an setzen. <laughs> and on setzen embouchure is one where you put lots of uh, uh, lots of bottle in it and not very much top of it, so that you trap with your rim a little tiny piece. It's actually fairly like a trumpet on the shirt, because you know, trumpet on the shirts, those guys have to play insanely high. You know, it's just crazy, because what are they gonna do for range if they don't? Their, their lowest good note is a middle G or an F sharp or something, that's a you know. So they have to really be able to play high if they're gonna play at all and they trap a little tiny, tiny piece of lip. Just like on the piano, if this thing was open, you can see that the high strings are very short because it's much easier to tighten something enough to be very, very high if it's just a short little thing. And so you trap a little tiny piece of lip and you use a lot more bottom lip. Well, uh, there are a lot of examples of that kind of writing in Bach, for example. If you go to the Brandenburg Concerto Number 1, He's got actually two pieces, two, two parts written for two high horn players. It's kind of weird. If you, you know, they're both really high. And that's the kind of playing that we treasure so much right now because high range is just so, so incredibly uh, valued in modern horn playing. Now the thing is, is that as things have progressed, uh, we're not allowed to make those kinds of decisions. Well, I'll just be a low horn player and not worry about playing high horn. I will simply play high and not develop my low range. We can't do that. So we have to come up with this big monster compromise. And it's actually not very good at any one thing, but not too bad at anything either. That's kind of where we're stuck with the armature we use. So what we do is we put the mouthpiece just where you were taught when you were kids. Now, who knows the, the students here, kind of what the textbook teaching is in terms of where to put the mouthpiece? Who can tell me that? Well, somebody through here probably knows this answer. Where do you put it on the lips if you're following the rules? Two-thirds on top. That's right, two-thirds up or one-third lower. And what that does for us as work players is it gives us some of the flexibility that has some of the low range capabilities that you get with that old long machine where you set it right inside and have almost no bottom at all. So we do preserve some of that flexibility and that, that, that ability that, you know, in the low range that we, we would have had if we played just the old setting in. But also, notice that we put the embouchure on the lip a little bit on the outside. Oh. So that we're ready when the time comes to play high. We can't play, however, as high as the early horn players could. Have you seen some of the early parts that were expected of early horn players in the Baroque that were just high horn players that didn't have to worry about having a low range? They go up to notes that today would be F above a G even, above high C, which I can't get on my triple on a good day. It just doesn't have, it's not built for.